This video is a lecture of the book Building Java Programs, Chapter 5, which is about program logic and indefinite loops. So we're going to be talking about while loops and various types of while loops like do while. We're going to be talking about random numbers as well as Boolean types and user input errors. So far the only loop that we've worked with is the for loop, which is great if you know how many times you want to execute the for loop. But in any game and many other cases, you don't know how many times the loop needs to be executed. So that's why there's the while loop. So the while loop looks like you write while and then you put a test in parens, kind of like an if. And then you have some open, closed, squiggly braces and then you have a bunch of statements. So for example here, while i is less than 200, i is going to be multiplied by 2. It's important to remember to set the variable to begin with. If you don't want to set the variable to begin with, then there's another form we'll learn about a little bit called the do while loop. So um, as I was pointing out, you need, do, you need to prime the loop. So in this case, i has to be declared and set. If you don't uh, set the value of the variable like here, I think Java will usually complain to you actually because it, it can detect that the variable was, yeah, it's, it, was, it was not initialized. So you want to prime that first. Now, unlike a for loop where it's already got a pre-programmed set of conditions to walk through the loop so many times, while loops could potentially never terminate if you don't do your code right. So, for example, here, while i is less than 200, we got i equals i times 2. But what happens if we don't have that i equals i times 2 we forget? Well, then it looks like this, and the, the loop never terminates. It just keeps on running. Um, here's another example. So, while j is greater than 1, but then we increment j from 100 going up. So that's never going to uh, uh, terminate ever as well. It's going to keep on going forever. So now we're going to talk about um, a, a subject that we've briefly touched on before, random numbers. You may remember the math random function here. The math random function returns a double between 0 and 1. And you may remember that if we wanted to get an integer out of this, we can multiply that by any number, say 8. And that'll give us a random number between 0 and 7, and if we want to make that an int, we have to force that to be an int. So that's what you've learned so far. Now there's another thing that you can use called the random class, and personally, if there's nothing that the random class can do for you that you can't do on your own, so it's not something that I think is critical, but it is a convenience, so this you can pass, uh, you can call it next int, so you have to create the new random class first of all, so there's a little bit of an overhead, and you've got a random a variable that is a random class item, and then you can pass in the number that you want. So instead of calling uh, math.random times 8 to get a number from 0 to 7, you can call next int dot, uh, next int with passing in 8, and now it'll give you, again, the same thing, a random integer between 0 and 7. So you, you um, it's basically the same. You don't have to force it to be an integer. It's one small difference. Uh, you can also get a double, but again, that's exactly what math random gives you, or a boolean, but you can almost do math.random times uh, 1, and then, or actually, you don't have to do anything. Um, it'll be between 0 and 1. You could evaluate whether it's greater than 1 half, or you could multiply it by 2, and then it'll be uh, 0 or 1. So, again, there's not really anything that you can't do in the random uh, math.random. I also wanted to briefly mention that random is never truly random. As you might suspect, computer programs always generate, uh, they have to follow code, and they generate the same results given the same inputs. So the only real trick here is that where it's getting its input from, which is typically, for example, the, uh, the current milliseconds of the system clock or something like that. So it's not truly random, and in fact, there you can easily statistically analyze these random functions, and you'll see that they're not random. There is a, a kind of a, what they call a period to the random numbers, and so if you hit the timing right, you can re reproduce the exact same sequence of numbers. Um, do not try to make it more random by doing something yourself, though, because they've found that whenever people try to do that, it becomes less random than what it already is. So a little earlier I mentioned that sometimes you may not know what the value that you're going to be testing is when you first enter the loop. Um, so in that case, you wait till the end to test the value. 
So of course that does mean you're going to execute it at least once. Um, and then this is called a do while loop. So it's got do, then the brackets and code, while, and then same paren with some evaluation and a semicolon. Okay. Next we're going to be talking about a class of algorithms that the book just calls fence post algorithms and fence post errors. If you ask any programmer what's a fence post error, they will tell you what it is and they will generally tell you you're off by one. And, and that's really the more general case of this error. But they call it a fence post error because if you take the analogy that the, the post here, that gives you in this example four posts. And then normally in a piece of fence work, you would want one, two, three pieces of fence. If you do a fourth piece of fence, then you just got these wires sticking out here. And so they call it a fence post error because you really want only three pieces of fences, even though you want four pieces, four poles. Um, so let's take a look at an example here. They simply want to print out uh, a list of these numbers here. In this case, they're using random numbers. And if you just do it the straightforward way of printing the, um, the numbers and then the uh, comma at the end, well, you're going to get an extra comma at the end. So there's a couple different solutions to this, but the book recommends that you print the first character outside the loop. Um, so they pull out um, the, the function here, the system out print, and that they pull out what they call half of the loop. They call this a, a loop and a half solution. So here's the half of the loop and here's the full loop here. Um, now there's a couple problems with this. One is that you've got repeated code. It's not a big deal here because it's just a system out print. But oftentimes this is many, many lines of code and you're going to duplicate it here and here. The other problem is that let's separate out these two operations, a comma and then the number. So we look at this list and it's obviously a number, comma, number, comma, number, comma, number. But if we look at here, now it's comma numbered, comma number, comma number. So that reverses the order in which you kind of expect these things to happen. So those are both downsides. But the upside is it's an easy way to teach it and it is reliable. So um, it, it's fine to do it this way. This is another similar problem called the sentinel loop. So basically, if you, uh, you're looking for a special value to end some loop, they call it a sentinel that you're looking for. And the, the problem, it's the same kind of problem um, where it, it's hard to do it just in a single loop. And so their solution is to do the same thing, with the, which they call a loop and a half. They take the full loop here, they take half the loop, which is printing out this next integer and getting the console, and they pull it outside the loop. And so this solves the general problem where you need to have some kind of priming in the system before you go into your loop. Okay. Um, by the way, I want to mention for a second, this is your industry minute for today, that if you go and you ask 10 professional programmers, what's a loop and a half? they will all look at you pretty much and say, what? What the heck is a loop and a half? The reason why is because professional programmers don't do a loop and a half. We consider this to be poor form because of the reasons that I mentioned previously. And there's another solution, but it's more complex. It involves putting an if statement in the while and having an early termination. And some people, especially academics, do not like that. Um, in the real world, that's the best way to do it. But in academia, this is the best way to do it. So I just wanted to let you know, don't, don't be asking your, uh, when you get a job, go, don't be asking people or telling people about your loop and a half solution because they won't like it. Okay. So this is sentinel loops and the loop and a half. Okay. So the solution is you pull out half of the loop and prime the pump that way. Okay. So now we're moving on to Booleans. Just like I've told you several times before, uh, in Java, we're going to be learning about one new thing all the time, and each of these new things applies, as I say, orthogonally to all other things. So anywhere you could use an int, you can also use a boolean. Um, it's not quite the true that that you can use uh, booleans are a special case of of ints and and whatnot, but you can use booleans anywhere, and and that's what we're going to be trying to explain here. So there's already a bunch of methods that you know that return booleans. It's not just for ints or strings, you can return a boolean starts with, whether it's true or false. And the boolean, uh, the values in Java are just true or false, lowercase. So uh, along with um, a simple boolean uh, data type, we need ways to calculate booleans. And you can, of course, say if 2 equals 2. Uh, that's a simple case. But sometimes you have to evaluate multiple things. 
And so there's the double ampersand here, or the double or, the double pipe for or. So in this case, it's the, the conjunction of this and this to be true, or it's this or this to be true, and then the bang or exclamation point is a not. So you, whatever this is, you flip it around. There's also an XOR, which is a really useful thing, but it's, it's beyond the scope of this course. But I, I distinctly remember that the first time I wrote a huge long test to see whether it was A or B, or it could be uh, A and, and not B, or it could be B and not A, but uh, not both A and B. And um, the, the professional I was working with looked at it and said, why did you just write an XOR? And I said, what's an XOR? So it is something that professionals will want to learn about. Okay, so short-circuited -circuit evaluation. So it's uh, Java is not always going to evaluate both operators. Uh, it may only evaluate one or the other. So if you have A and B, if A falls, uh, fails, then it's not going to bother to evaluate B. And for ORs, if um, A, if it's A or B, if A is true, then it doesn't need to, to evaluate. Um, it doesn't need to evaluate B. It already knows that the result is true. Um, there's no examples of this, but but basically, uh, there's two things to to worry about with short-circuited evaluation. One is that you ha have to remember that not both sides of a Boolean comparison, both sides may not be evaluated. Okay, so if you're trying to do an assignment in one half, it may never happen. And then the second thing is um, it can be a solution because if, for example, you're trying to look at the caret of some length and you first have to test whether the length is valid, then that'll save the second half from throwing an error because you're looking at a character that doesn't exist. So it's both a good and bad thing. Okay, so here's some examples of Boolean variables. So here, uh, the temperature is nice if the temperature is above 60 and below 85. So we've got this double ampersand doing those checks. And um, here, rainfall is none. We check whether inches of rain equals zero. Social day is whether friends seen greater than two. That's a simple test. Or a good day is defined as the temperature is nice and the rainfall is none and social day. So there's some examples of how you can use the Boolean logical operators. Okay, so you can set a Boolean variable as a flag. Sometimes this will be helpful if you have a loop and you want to only do certain things inside or possibly outside of the loop depending on what happened. You can do this loop here. The loop you have to initialize. This uh, flag is false. Inside the loop, if the sum is ever less than zero, then they're setting negative to be true. And then when they get out of the loop, they're testing negative to see what to print here. Okay. Negating Boolean expressions. You know, this is nothing uh, that you can't figure out on your own. But basically, you can negate an AND or an OR and use something called De Morgan's Laws to figure out what the um, actual expression is going to be. It's not really critical. Um, depending on exactly what your code is, you might want it one way or the other. But so example, we looked at temperature nice as the temperature is over 60 and less than 85. So if you were to negate that, the, the opposite, the temperature nasty, is the temperature is either less than 60 or the temperature is greater than 85. So that's the way it kind of works. But I, I wouldn't worry too much about De Morgan's Laws. Okay, the last major topic is user errors. So many times we get input from the users and we have to worry that their error may not be correct. I mean, sorry, their input may not be valid. So um, there's a couple of things that happen when the user input is not valid. If you don't do anything, it will probably uh, throw an exception, which uh, will stop your program and it will spit out some error messages at the command line. And that's not good, but to be honest, at this stage in your education, that's not such a terrible thing. Um, there's lots of different errors you can make, and this is just one of them. But if you don't want that to happen, and you know that it's possible that someone can give you some incorrect input, then what you want to do is you want to handle those errors up front. And this is showing an example here. Instead of just asking for an int, with they use this routine, get int. 
And what getInt does is it uses what we call scanner look ahead to determine is the next token that's out there, is that going to be an int or not? So here we check if the console has next int. While it doesn't, they discard it by pulling that off of the queue. They pull it off the console and it prints this error message and it goes back and repeats. So this is using both while loops and scanner look ahead. Let's show you what the scanner look ahead is. You can check whether it has, there is an X tokens with you has next, has next int, has next double. And again, all these things do not actually pull anything off of the console, in, uh, off the scanner. So they're still sitting out there waiting for you to actually call um, next or next int or next double on them. But you can look ahead and see what, what is out there. Okay, so what we reviewed, uh, what we did today is we looked at the while loop. We looked at how to prime the while loop. Also, while I'm talking about priming, uh, remember that uh, the loop and a half solution is basically priming the loop. Um, we looked at random numbers using math.random or the random class. Uh, we looked at the do while loop, which is a variation of the, of the while loop when you don't yet know what the value that you're testing is going to be. And we looked at, it's not mentioned here, but we looked at the fence post algorithm and the sentinel algorithm, which they solve through their loop and a half method. Um, we looked at Booleans, and we looked at how you can set a Boolean variable in a loop and then use that after the loop. We also looked at how you can use AND, double AND, and double OR to evaluate complex expressions for Booleans. And we also talked about how to make a program robust so that it won't just throw an exception. So these are all of our concepts for this week, and I look forward to, to working with you another week.